Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to An Ear for Men. I'm Paul Elam. And today I'm joined by a good friend and very important guest, Tom Golden. Tom, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, Paul. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Folks, we're going to talk about borderline personality. And, you know, this is almost like, I, I think, in fairness to the borderlines who will see the title as clickbait and come on in, that uh, we give a trigger warning in the beginning. And I want to make this as clear and honest as possible. You know, we're not here to make the lives of borderlines um, to give them any more problems than they already have. That's not the intent. But what there is a need for and a dire shortcoming of is information for men who get involved with borderline women and some of the consequences that come with that and the daily ongoing struggle that a relationship like that can be. And so we're talking about it from that perspective. Our, our focus here and our desire to address matters is entirely about how this impacts other people. If you have borderline personality disorder, I would suggest that you avail yourself to many of the online and real world resources that are out there. Uh, you certainly deserve compassion and help for your problem. Uh, however, this is not the conversation where that's going to be a part of the picture. Uh, so with that, I want to move on. Tom, why don't we start with just some of the basics here. Let's assume for a moment, even though a lot of my audience, and I suspect yours too, are aware of borderline personality, let's talk about some of the basics. Yeah. Uh, what is borderline personality? Yeah. Uh, the, the meaning seems to be changing with each, each issue of the yes, it does. It does. Uh, but but let's talk issues. about, for practical purposes, what do we need to know about this disorder? I think the first thing, Paul, is just to understand that it, you know, the way it's described in the DSM, or at least that it's four, is a pervasive pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships. And that kind of sums it up, really. I mean, it's a pervasive pattern of instability. It's just up and down, kaboom. You know, it's just something that can't be predicted a lot of times. And um, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, it's difficult for the person who's got it, and it's difficult for the people who have to deal with the person who's got it. Now, how would we differentiate that, for instance, Tom, from someone, you know, as we know, some women with codependency issues will latch on to one drug addict or one alcoholic after another or somebody with major life problems that aren't being addressed. And therefore, one might say that there is a per pervasive pattern of instability in relationships with that. So yeah. how do we separate that sort of thing from understanding what's driving a borderline? Well, I think with borderlines, the pattern of instability is oftentimes around being abandoned and being left. And this is a tip off. You know, the, the, there was a phrase a while back, I remember, what was it something like, um, um, I hate you, don't leave me. You know, something like that. It's like, you know, there's this huge instability and difficulty, but if there's any sense of being left, kaboom, everything blows up. So the instability oftentimes is around this whole thing of, of being left and being abandoned. Now, there is a, I know that with my experience with working with borderlines and seeing them, and particularly working with their spouses and other family members, that there is uh, one of the things that's persistent is a pattern of elevating someone, almost deifying them, and then kicking the pedestal out from underneath them, and the, all of a sudden you hate the ground that they walk on, you wish them uh, ill. Now, yeah. is, is this the sort of thing that is triggered, Triggered, you think, by that abandonment issue, that, uh, that once they feel abandoned, all of a sudden you're a demon? I think that is exactly what triggers it, and it's very tricky. And this, of course, is what is so dangerous for men, you know, is that um, we're attracted to this really beautiful woman, you know, who is who is so attracted to us that she becomes one with us very quickly, overnight, sometimes less than overnight. And there's this wonderful connection you have, and all the sex in the world, and and she doesn't want to leave you. And then all of a sudden, you know, Monday night, Monday night's the time we play poker. You know, this is, this is the time the guys get, 
<laughs> you know, the things blow. There's this, there's this complete and utter um, uh, blowing of the fuse that happens because it's the sense then that that person's going to lose this connection. You know, they're going to lose, and this thing of abandonment comes up. And of course, this freaks the guy out. He's going, "What? You know, poker is that bad? <laughs> you know, what's going on?" It just throws him into a a spiral of not knowing what the hell's happening because he's this wonderful lady that he's so connected with all of a sudden is just going bonkers, you know? And in a lot of guys, what you see, this is the point in the relationship where they start sending themselves down the toilet because they will in fact give up the poker game uh, and, and give in to that reaction. But I think you, you touched on something else too, that I think we probably need to look at a little bit more. And my experience with this is that borderlines are often borderline women are often very attractive very sexual talk about you know porn style sex uh, you're getting it all anything you want in the bed she'll do it and do it three times you know <laughs> it doesn't matter and i mean this is a real big hook oh boy if you give the average guy an attractive woman that you know is ready to swing from the chandeliers and uh, bring in another partner and all kinds of other things nirvana and, and then all of a sudden that's a huge hook a huge hook that's a nirvana and yet poker doesn't seem so important for a while absolutely know? more chandeliers baby <laughs> more chandeliers and yeah. so, yeah. you know i realized the the depth of what it is that we're suggesting to men here that by the way you know, if, if, if you get a 10 who's, you know, constantly ready to do anything that you want in the bed and delivers porn style blowjobs at the snap of your fingers, you may be in trouble uh, in the end. Um, it's and so that's, hard a, that's a heartbreaking that. message to have to sit here and say. Yes, it's so hard to define that as trouble. Yeah, it is. And maybe but, it's not. I mean, maybe you've struck it rich in some ways, but the chances are if it's real quick, uh oh, look out, guys. Look out. This is, you know, danger, Will Robinson. Danger. And let's talk about that the real quick, because one of the things that we know with borderlines, one of the ways that they suck men in, well, they're, they're, and this comes in two parts. One is love bombing. When you've been, you're on a second date with somebody, or even the first date toward the end of it, and all of a sudden, she's telling you you're the most wonderful man she's ever known in her life how could you be so perfect how could you be so perfect for her you're everything she's been looking for a man man i tell you what if there ever a time to fucking run it's like run forest run <laughs> um, that is a is it not tom a huge warning sign the inappropriate you know, too much, too soon with love bombing right off in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, as good as it might feel, that's a real danger sign. You got to kind of keep on your toes. You know that they, this may not be the best thing for you in the long run. But also, you know, keep on your toes and see. I mean, what you want is a balance of of uh, fights and, and lovemaking. I mean, you want to be able to say no to her, and she wants to be able to say no to you, and you work that back and forth, you know. But with a borderline, oftentimes you can never say no. And you get to the point where you feel like, I can't say no. I can't say if I do, oh my, this or that will happen. You know, and when you get to that point, guys, it's time to think about getting away. Because you've gotten sucked in, you know, it's dangerous. Yeah, and the other side to what we were just talking about with the love bombing is too much information too soon. Yeah. If, if, if you've just met somebody and then they're going into details about their childhood sexual abuse and you know before you finished your entrees at dinner that's a, to me that's another solid yes. one yes um, get out right and, in there and it is not unusual at all for borderlines to have a lot of old trauma you know the reason i had worked with borderlines at all was because i worked with grief and death and dying for years. And the one thing that will help a borderline is to really deal with grief. Because that's the problem. You know, everything else, the abandonment, the, the histrionics is all surface. It's all, you know, bullshit. 
you know, but when people deal with that grief, in fact, they talk about personality disorders, the only way that a personality disorder can shift is by dealing with their old pain and going straight through the pain rather than around it by blaming others, by getting crazy, by doing this or doing that. So what I found it, with grief is that a lot of times people would come to me for grief and it would end up being a borderline situation where, um, you know, she was then working on, and it's usually she is, by the way, you know, I think uh, the DSM says 75%, but it's, boy, it's like more than that for me. Yeah, uh, I think so too. Of course, now you've got your faction of uh, uh, psychology as a profession out there now saying, no, no, there's just as many uh, male borderlines. I've never found that to be true. I I've do never wanna, seen one. Uh, I, I think I did see one. Really? In, in 92. <laughs> Back in 92. Back in 92, it was a year of, of strange happenings. Yeah. Um, one of the things I want to point out, though, since Tom talked about this, about them moving through the grief and getting to the other side of that, please don't interpret that because what a lot of guys will hear is, oh, I can help her. <laughs> Good That's point. What, moving through that grief as you would with somebody without a personality disorder with the help of a, a therapist is one thing. Yes. Getting a borderline personality to move through their grief in a healthy way, it's, that's, I would say that's the theory of helping them. And I think it probably may have some benefit in there. Is it gonna make any difference in the potential impact on your life? In a relationship with a borderline is it a method by which you can say well baby let's sit down why don't you tell me about all the things that happened to you and and i want to help you through your grief not recommended not recommended at all um as a matter of fact with a lot of borderlines if you start tapping into their actual grief their tendency to turn around and blame you for the life problems i think would more than likely increase i've seen that I've certainly seen that before. On the other hand, I don't want to tell guys not to be open to their partner's pain. You know, I think that what guys need to do is to be smart about it. And if doing that for their loved one becomes hurtful, stop it. You know, but sometimes it can be really helpful. And just like for her, she needs to listen to him and his crap. Because that's the benefit of having a, a relationship is someone who can then help you process the crap that's going on. But you're absolutely right, guys. This is this is not something you usually want to do at home. <laughs> you know? don't, don't try this at home because it is very tricky. I mean, I spent years with some of these folks, and uh, it's very difficult. Gosh, you know, in therapy, a borderline oftentimes at the end of each session, there's trouble <laughs> because you see the end of a session is abandonment. You're being left. And so I had what I found was I could warn people. I could warn them about 10 or 15 minutes before the end of the session. I'd say, you know, we've got 10 minutes left. How do we want to spend that 10 minutes? And it would almost, it would usually kind of help to soften that, that abandonment thing that comes up. You know, because they're, they're going, oh yeah, we got to stop. we got to stop. This is going to happen. Gives them a little preparation for it, you know. Uh, but it's very tricky. This is not an easy thing. And, uh, you know, guys, please, you know, if, if you try and work with uh, the woman in your life and she's having troubles that are just crazy to you, it doesn't make any sense, do like Paul says, back out, you know. Find, maybe even go see a, a pro, go see a, a therapist about how to deal with someone. Or read Paul's book, you know, even better. Well, uh, I can recommend the book. I can recommend a lot of things, but I think what it, the bottom line, it goes back to exactly what Tom said. I mean, you have to make choices about any relationship. It doesn't matter if it's a borderline or not. You're always going to be pitted the choice against what you sacrifice and what you don't sacrifice, where you give, where you don't give, what you try to nurture, what you try to help protect in another person, and what you just simply have boundaries with. Those are all decisions you have to make through any relationship. And with a borderline personality, you are going to make that decision many more times than you will with somebody else. But I agree, it's important not to disregard the fact that in, especially in extreme cases, borderlines are in so much pain emotionally yes. 
that they'll yeah. sit and slice their arms open in yes. order to mitigate the emotional pain. Yes. In. So again, I'm not saying this. I understand what their plight is. I'm not, and I'm not saying this to to advocate being cruel to borderlines. But what I am suggesting is that slicing on the arm that can become what happens to your soul and to your personal life in a relationship with a borderline too. It can be a victim just as much that way. And I don't think you could blame any man at all for looking at that and saying, no, thank you. Right. right. Yes. And that's exactly what men need to learn to do in all relationships is to say no. Now, you've got to say no whether it's a borderline or, or a wonderfully healthy uh, a woman. I mean, you've got to say no when you mean it, you know? Because I, Paul, the therapy I've done with couples over the years, it's just taught me that men have a hard time learning how to say no to their wives. Over and over, I see the same thing, and she'll ask for the moon. Oh, you need to do this on Thursdays and Tuesdays, la, la, la. You know, okay, honey, okay, honey. He needs to say no, Tuesdays is poker. You know, no, we're going, we're playing basketball that day. No, you do such and such. You got to get in there and, and, and fight, guys. You can't sit back. And if you go in there and say what you need and what you want with a borderline, she's going to blow and you'll know that you're in the wrong place. You know, but learn how to say no in a loving way. I mean, it can be really easy to say no in a loving way. You know, nope, not going to do that. That's not good for me. That's not what I want to do. I want to do something different. That's all you got to say. And then watch your blow. <laughs> That's all you got to say. But as you pointed out, that is, you know, it, it, this is a tough thing to talk about because as usually as men, we want us to always see ourselves as confident and in control. Yes. You know, we're, we're programmed to measure ourselves by that. So when you tell a guy, you know, you're not even able to say no to your wife or your girlfriend or your kids yeah. because I've seen that. Oh boy. Often too, where the children will be pushing the father around. Yep. Um, and then it doesn't really matter if you've got a borderline or not. You've got a situation that it's hard for your self-respect to thrive where you're being bullied all the time. And I'm just going to be frank. Borderlines are some of the most skilled bullies that you will ever encounter in your life. They will bully you so slickly that you may not even notice it. And it's usually done with shame. It's usually done with trying to humiliate you for not meeting her expectations. Not um, only that, but it's your fault. Yep. I'm so upset. It's your fault. <laughs> you know, if guys, if you're in a relationship where everything is your fault, think about it. You know, the, <laughs> and you know, it works like that. If you're aware that you're in a relationship where everything is your fault and you're willing to stay in that re relationship, then you're right <laughs> for letting it happen. Um, and, you know, I, again, we deal, in, we deal in reality here as much as possible. And, again, I encourage you to think about what Tom said when he said he had to prepare a borderline client for the end of a session that has yeah. a predetermined length that the a sense of abandonment is so sensitive and so strong. And even if it's not based on real childhood history, that's a, another subject because not all borderlines have abusive histories. A lot of them do. Some don't. Huh. But if you are dealing with somebody who at the end of 50 minutes needs preparation for that 50 minutes to be up and the session to be over. Uh, show you, uh, tell you another example. I've had borderlines in group settings that were furious at me because I didn't sit by them Ooh. in the group. You left them. Yes. I, I essentially was sending the message that I hated them. And they're not important. And they're not important. Right. And then if I wasn't careful in those scenarios, then the whole group came up, became yes. about them. Easily. And this is what I'm talking about when I say when you try to get into tinkering with or trying to help a borderline through something, I never got anywhere when I allowed that group to become about the borderline's abandonment because the facilitator didn't sit next to them. Yes. Um, that kind of thing, again, 
is you have to have some generally some clinical experience to know how to shut that stuff down effectively without you know shredding your group to pieces yes. is that the sort of skill level you want to have to practice in a relationship yes somebody because those relationships are supposed to be about your needs too exactly use for you usually when you are with a borderline partner it's never about your needs ever 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 as a matter right. of fact it is about your needs in a way it's about what needs you're going to sacrifice <laughs> that's a good point it is and this is yeah. the kind of bear that you're dealing with and it's why i say fine i would recommend that yes i agree that i think if they could process through their grief in a healthy way they would probably show some real fundamental improvement in how they're doing and how they're interacting in the world but the chances of that happening with their romantic partner it's difficult and unlikely and it's unlikely if they go to a psychotherapist it is generally unlikely until they are old enough that their sexual attraction and power starts fading uh -huh. that's not clinically documented that is my anecdotal observations over a period of 30 plus years okay. is that borderlines tend to start improving when they can no longer sexually manipulate with the ease that they used to uh -huh. because it forces them into another behavior set that they never had to practice as long as you know, you have white knights and, and uh, really obsequious men hopping around saying, yes, baby, what can I do for you? <laughs> um, when that stops happening for them, they have to rely on other things. Uh -huh. And so they start acting differently at that point. But early on, man, it's this is a, a tough area for a man to cross. Yes. And you can have women. I'm going to ramble one more minute and give the floor back to you, Tom. Go, baby. But I, I think they need to hear this. There are also women who have borderline traits and who may not be at this extreme end yes, of yes. things. And, you know, one thing, and I'm going to bring it up and then hand the floor very, very <laughs> devilishly to Tom, right. is that. If you look at borderline traits and you look at the the behavior of average women, how much difference do you really see? Take it away, Tom. No, I actually agree with that. You know, I think that what you see is a watered down um, version of the same thing. You know, in relationships, uh, there are very, very few women who are really interested in the man's emotional pain. I can count them on my one hand of, of, of the people I've known who can, the women who can do that. They're just not interested, but they're very interested in him knowing about her pain. So yeah, this is not something that is only borderlines. You know, you get a, a more watered down version and the healthier the woman is, the less watered down it is, the more human she's going to be and the more she's going to be able to go back and forth with you. She'll hear your crap. She'll be able to say no to you. You're able to say no to her and uh, you meet each other's needs. But that's pretty rare too, you know, it's in our culture because, geez, a flip Paul. I mean, we've taught women that they're supposed to be getting everything. Men have had everything for so long. It's her chance now to have it all. The fuck does that mean? You know, have it all. Just what they say it means. I mean, God. That's just unbelievable. And so we've got these high expectations from women about what a relationship should be like. And <laughs> the poor guys are going, how can I do that? I can't measure up to that expectation. I remember years ago watching John Gray on a television show, and he was talking about this sensitivity in men. And, he, of course, he was doing this for a women's audience, and he was selling Venus and Mars. and uh, I'm sorry, personal opinion, what a crap of a book. <laughs> but he was asked about, you know, women wanting sensitive men. And he said the most honest thing that I could possibly imagine him ever saying. He what said, no, that? you don't understand. You're not supposed to be sen sensitive to your feelings. She wants you to be sensitive to hers. Wow, John Gray said that? Yes, he actually said that. He gets too much of that. And what he was saying was, to me, expect borderline behavior out of women. Expect your feelings, your concerns, your wants, your needs, your desires, your ambitions, your dreams. Expect none of that to matter. 
in the long run. Expect what she wants to matter. And of course, as we know, a lot of times in our experience with modern women in this culture, what they want changes every five minutes. And uh, they want it until they have it. And then they want something else. <laughs> and they're sent into this perpetual dance. Oh, this? Okay, well, let me do that dance. Or, oh, yeah. well, you don't want that dance. You want this dance. Well, I'll go over here and do this dance then. Yes. A lot of men live their lives that way. And they're not anywhere near a borderline. They're just near the average woman. Yes. And men need to understand that and prepare for battle. I mean, this is like a battle in some ways, and uh, you can get a lot of good things out of a good fight. You know, in fact, that's that's the way we get closer with people is to fight and say no, work it out, compromise, then we get closer. You do that every day, and you start to get closer and closer and closer. But it, you don't get closer if you don't you don't fight it out. If you don't say, "I need this," "I need that," how can we make this happen? Because I only play only people I hear doing that is the women. And the men are not following through. They're not saying, oh, look, here, look, I need this, this, and this. How can we make that happen? Guys. That would, that would be misogynistic. Exactly. Exactly. It's against the rules. You know, for a guy, and you've got to say, fuck the rules. You know, I've got to stand up for myself. Because if you don't, you're going to be fucked for life. You know, just, oh, shush. Ay, ay, ay. It, it is true, and that's something that, you know, we, that led us to another, I think, really perfect point to discuss, Tom. Sorry, I've got a, a motion detector light that keeps, every time yeah, I move. I just was thinking, I see the light! I see the light! <laughs> well, actually, that's the cops. The <laughs> um, but, you know, we Paul's talked angel. about men that can't muster the spine, the courage, or the fortitude, whatever we want to call it, man up if you're at a, at a failure for anything else, but men who can't muster up the courage to say no, to have limits, to fight for themselves, for their own integrity, for their own, uh, you know, their own sense of needs in the relationship. Men, we talked earlier about fear of abandonment. And yeah. I've got a theory about this, that as men, we're pretty much socialized and maybe even engineered genetically, who knows, but definitely socialized that we put all of our emotional eggs in one basket, generally with one woman. Uh, that's what men tend to do. And we see this connection to this one emotional outlet, one emotional source of support, one place of normalcy in life. We see that as something that we have to make concessions for in order to keep. Yes. And because there is the fear of abandonment in men that if I say no, she's going to leave me. And you know what? She might. I'm not doing my job. Yeah. My job is to keep her happy. So what do you suggest, Tom, for guys when they come across that? Because, you know, I've talked about this with a lot of clients. I've talked about it with a lot of men over the years. And usually when you sort through some of the stuff, you get down to it, they're afraid. Yes. What I recommend is practice, practice, and practice. Start small. Start with a little thing that you might want or a little thing that bugs you about what she does and say, you know, that really bugs me. You know, just start with a small thing and work your way up. Get practice at it. Get to know that you're going to be able to hold your own in a conversation and to say, no, that's not going to work like that. You know, let's do it like this, or how about this? So it's just a matter of practice and choosing a safe way to start. You know, choosing a way to start that is um, easy, something easy. You know, start off with with, with the t-ball, you know, where you put the ball on the stand and you can whack the hell out of it, you know, but, uh, and then build up from there, you know. I, th I think that's really a good idea. It, it's, a, it's a difficult job to ask men for because by and large, Men are not only taught that they have to make concessions in order to, they have to give things up to have a woman. Uh, women gain a man in order to get to the things that they want. Yes. You know, the white picket fence, the house, the children, the, the other things that they've dreamt of in their life. But men have to sacrifice in order to, to make that relationship happen. Right. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a bum deal in the beginning. Absolutely. Plus, we never teach men how to fight with women. We teach them not to fight 
Correct. Women. Correct. I watched a, a show not too long ago about uh, couples who had been married more than 50 years. And they were asking them how they made things work. Huh. Over and over and over again throughout this thing, all the men said nearly the same thing. Give her what she wants. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, crap. And so what I'm trying to, what the reason I'm saying all this to point something else out is that if you're going to hang on to your dignity and to your own dreams and you really want fairness in a relationship, you will have to fight for it. Yes. You will have to risk the loss of that relationship yes. in order to have those things. Because if you fight, but you're ultimately not willing to allow her to leave, she'll know that in the first two nanoseconds. Yep. And you're done. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and here folks, we started out talking about borderlines. And we're really just talking about women. We're and still talking. About it's hard to tell the difference. You know, it's, it's the same thing, though. Like you have said before, Paul, it's the same thing. And you've got to learn how to set limits. You've got to learn how to say no. And that's what helps. You know, the other thing we need to talk about a little bit is what does help borderlines. And the DBT stuff, do you know about that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're having a lot of success with people who are borderlines uh, using this DBT therapy. And so if you've got someone you love who is borderline, um, think about it. You know, check out the DBT folks. It's a dia something behavior therapy. It's a it's a uh, um, technique that seems to work. So I would highly recommend it. You know, because it's probably going to be a lot quicker and easier than traditional therapy, which is very slow with borderlines, glacial. But it does work. But it's it's glacial. It's slow. And of course, I've got to be in here with the the disclaimer caveat. Whether or not DBT works, and again, this is sort of like there's diet fads. You never know when somebody's an advocate of a particular approach. Right. They tend to see a lot more success than somebody whose objective might. I just caution men most urgently to not invest your decisions based on outcome of care for cognitive therapies for borderline personality. That's just my experience. I don't see enough efficacy of any of this stuff that would protect a man who's otherwise in a situation where it's dangerous for him. Because one of the things we didn't talk about, what happens at the extremes of this, false allegations of rape, sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, manipulating your family and friends to turn against you. Yes. Folks, this is what borderlines do, and they do it with vicious effectiveness. They're like surgeons at it. And yes. if you don't think it'll happen to you, then all I can say is lots of luck that, with that. Really? But there are some extreme outcomes, including violence, uh, but in, in a lot of times getting enlisting proxy violence against you. There's all these things that happen, can and do happen with borderlines, that if you're in the middle of a relationship and you know it's abusive and you know you're being hurt, please don't hear about these treatments and say, ah, that will be my answer. Your answer is to get away from abuse, period, end of story. Um, because the end of it isn't pretty. And it's dangerous. Absolutely. Yes, use caution whichever way you turn. So yeah, by all means, re refer them to somebody that does DBT. Um, and absolutely, there's no need to just ignore their problem. Uh, offer them a way to get some help. Yeah. But yeah, I've never done DBT, and I don't know anybody who has. But I've just heard through the grapevine that they're having some success. So I really, you know, I should put that disclaimer on there for myself. I've read into it, and there is some pretty harsh critics of it, too. Really? Yeah. Um, I would like for there to be a treatment for borderlines. Like I yeah. said, I can't imagine yeah. living with that level of misery uh, in my yeah. life. And I certainly wish, you know, the best for them in and dealing people, with this problem. People, um, they need to understand what's underneath this stuff. I mean, 
with borderlines, the reason they're acting out, false accusing, blah, blah, doing this and that is because of this pain that's just under the surface. It's a huge amount of hurt. And they feel so poorly about themselves that they're willing to cut themselves. And it's the cutting when you watch your blood start to come up. You focus on that blood rather than the pain in your own thoughts of how bad you are. I mean, that's what they're doing, you know, is this, this sense that I am bad. I am, I am not just not good. I am bad. And it's a horrible kind of situation for people to be in. And so, yeah, any kind of port in a storm with something like that. Um, and the only thing that I've seen with my own eyes work has been traditional therapy that's, that's at least a little bit analytic in the, um, in the part of it is analytic, you know. But um, even that but, is... But I would imagine that, that where you saw it have some benefit probably wasn't with borderlines that were on the extreme end of the spectrum. People who were a little bit older and things had cracked open. Yeah, now, like I talked about before, when people come for grief, it's like they, they're cracked open. It's like, boom, the grief has opened them up to all of the old pain inside. And when you can really address that old pain, that's what brings that crap down about feeling bad about you, you know, seeing yourself as a, a total shit. You know, when you can look at that old pain, and be in it and feel it, that crap starts coming down. Gives you a little bit of relief, but it's a slow burn. I mean, it just, you know, it takes a long time. It is a slow burn, and the tendency in borderlines to immediately project and blame and deflect responsibility for things, <laughs> that is pretty pretty tightly <laughs> woven in stuff. It's, it's just yeah. a, a really a bear to unravel that. Yes, it's it very, very will difficult. never happen. Um, yeah. That is, I still think, the most likely outcome. And one of the reasons I feel that way is that if you look, like if you look, I've done a couple of other, two or three other videos on borderlines. And they, I put disclaimers on them. I pointed out that these were for men who have been impacted negatively in their lives by their experiences in a borderline relationship. And that I didn't wish any of them ill and I wanted them to go get help. But just like I said at the beginning of this one, that this wasn't the place for that. And nonetheless, they still absolutely come in and flood the comments with the message, quit talking about your pain and start paying attention to mine. You just don't understand where I am. Really? Yes, hundreds and hundreds of comments. If you look at my video, you can spot a borderline from a mile away. I've probably already removed 500 comments from borderlines on that coming in to express their outrage that I would dare speak up about men taking care of themselves first and, and not taking care of borderlines. Huh. And the sense of entitlement in yeah. it, and indifference to the pain of others. Um, you know, it, it is like we had one come up recently, and I'm sure it was a borderline or something close to it. Terrence Pop, and I know he won't mind me bringing this up because he put it in the comments. His ex-wife, during the process of their divorce, killed his dog <clears throat> just to inflict pain. And, you know, I think about that. I think about, you know, I love my dogs like they're kids. You know, it's like somebody doing that. I'm afraid would put me over the edge. Really? And a woman came in to lecture him on how it was all his fault oh. for making the wrong choices. Oh. And so I put it to any guys watching this now. If the woman you're with is capable of that kind of thinking, what the holy fuck are you doing with a human being like that? Just straight up, I would ask myself, what am I doing here? And it's very difficult to leave. And it is, because that's the ultimate. You are the bad guy. Yes, and they'll make you suffer, which is oh, why, we really, boy. why we really suggest that you think very, very carefully before getting involved. Yes, exactly. Catch it early. Yep. Catch it early. You know, as a. I, one of the things that I someone told me a long time ago was um, we can we cannot control 
how attracted we are to someone, but we can control how fast we get the fuck out if we need to, you know? So you're going to find that you're attracted to a lot of people, you know, and, but you've got to really evaluate them and go, okay, is this good or is this not good? Is this time for me to exit or is this time for me to, to stick in there? You know, so, you know, we can't control who we're attracted to. Oh my gosh. Kate Upton. Can't control it. <laughs> Out of control. Yeah. Uh, oh. Sorry if, if, if uh, sorry, Kate. <laughs> I won't even say what I'm. Oh, thinking. go ahead. Uh, no, no. Well, just don't stick your dick in crazy. Really. And you've got a responsibility, and you know this is true. Bottom line, just my personal philosophy: there is no victims. There's only volunteers. <laughs> That's what I firmly believe in. If, if, if you let what your dick is telling you, make all your decisions, you know, if I think a woman is hot, but I notice that her mascara is running down in a jagged line and her <laughs> lipstick is off on the corner of her mouth or something and she's talking to cats while pushing a cart, I'm not going to fuck her. <laughs> okay? It's just not going to happen. <laughs> and... and you know, maybe you get that with the, you can see all the gray hair I get. You don't, you know, I wouldn't have said that at 20. No. It would have been hard at 30 and probably still a little hard at 40. Yeah. But it is still ultimately, <laughs> and I'm saying this as a guy, I get emails every day from guys that are past the point of no return. Their kids have been taken, the, the I mean, every day they're, 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 they've been falsely accused. They're living in their car, sending me an email from the public library. I get all these emails. Because, but boy, with the beginning, it was really hot, man. Yep, yep exactly. Um, and I just hate seeing that. I hate seeing men drug through that. I hate even hearing about it. Yeah. That hurts. Yeah, it's too bad. And so I'd like to decrease those emails. That's why we're having this talk. Good. I, like I would like to decrease those emails. I like that. And I'd like to get emails from guys. Hey, man, I spotted this girl. She was a real turn on, but she said this and that. And I, all of a sudden, I knew to stay away from her. I ran like hell. Those are the emails I'd like to get. Yeah. Tom, is there anything else that you want to add? I think we're good. Okay. I think yeah. it has been a good conversation. I do want to close with a, with a thought that's off the topic. This hangout will be going out first to my patrons and to tom's patrons over there and it'll be going live on both of our channels after whatever period of time we determine it's our way both of our way to say thank you to the people supporting us on patreon you know these work producing these videos is actually a job <laughs> it actually takes quite a bit of time uh to invest in all this and money uh, for the equipment and everything else and the, you guys on Patreon that support what we're doing, uh, you're gold. Uh, and can't say thank you enough. I wish we had more free material uh, for you. But if, as I'm sure you understand, ultimately, the idea is for as many men as possible to get a hold of this material. So we're, we can't just hold everything back. Uh, but we would like to put talks like these out early for our Patreon subscribers, our, our patrons, to say thank you. Yes. for supporting our work. What you're doing yes. is, is really important, and it's helping people. Amen. I'm with you on that. Okie doke. Thank you, Patreon subscribers. Appreciate it. And with that, um, I'd like to do this again sometime, Tom. I was just going to say that. Well, how about we do it from your channel next time? That'd be good. Uh, we'll get it out in the same way. With that, I right. uh, want to wish everybody a good day. You will find in the 20 seconds following the broadcast of this, you will find a link to my Patreon and to always to subscribe to the channel. That's another way. Even if you don't have money, you can support us by subscribing and sharing the videos with people. Yeah, that's a good point. And we really appreciate that. With that, I wish everybody a good day. You guys take care. We'll see you next time. Happy Memorial Day.